Mm. Probably. Yeah, we are going to talk about relativity and electrodynamics. Uh, we're not going to do anything new today. All the material that we have studied in the last month or so, uh, I'm not going to add anything to it. This is a promise that, that we made at the beginning of the lecture series. The only thing we're going to do is take what we know, electrodynamics, and put it in the framework of relativity. No new physics, just a new notation where it makes it extremely uh, easy to see how these two things are connected. And hopefully by the end of this lecture you will have seen that there was no choice for nature, quote unquote, to have relativity built into electrodynamics. Now, in order to do so, what I would like to do is a sort of recap. Can we make this an interactive thing? That you just shout a couple of things about either electrodynamics or special relativity? We're going to make these two uh, summary series of notes on the board here, so we can refer back to these. To shout out whatever you want, just give me a second to write down what we're going to talk about. This is going to be our uh, relativistic excuse me, uh, electrodynamics, the relativistic part is going to later. And this is where we're going to put our special relativity. And <coughs> let's make this a little bit interactive. Just uh, shout anything that you remember from either of these two topics. So by the end of the next 10 minutes or so, we will have a nice summary of those things. Of course, we're not going to do all the mathematics again, just the basic results. Time dilation. Time dilation, okay. Uh, I'm guessing you meant it here, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you happen to recall what the formula was? Uh, T equals gamma T1 or other way around, or, t or gamma over T. I don't remember which. Okay. Uh, well, two things. Um, I, I prefer to say dt or uh, right. delta t because t is a moment in time. And the only thing that special relativity says anything about is durations. It doesn't say anything about now versus the next moment. It says something about the amount of time in between. They always say that special relativity is a theory of space and time. But it's not, it's not a theory of moments in, in, in time and positions in space. It's about distances and durations. So let's make them durations, like these. Then now we have two dt's. And which one is which? Tau to the right. This is a d tau. I mean, I'm very happy to change the notation, but what does that mean? Proper time. OK, what does proper time mean? Oh. Yeah. What is it? Uh, perspective to the event. Moving with respect not, moving. not moving with respect to what? To the event. To, okay, but there's always two events, yes? You cannot have a duration or a distance. But the event takes at the same place. Okay, that is correct. All right. Uh, you know, you're extremely right. Uh, just being very puristic about yeah. the terminology here. Um, the inertial um, time. The non what is the uh, Let me save that, that point for the next one. Okay, I'm going to be very puristic in my terminology here again. Special relativity is a theory about durations and distances. It's not about moments in time and positions in space. It's about duration. So this is why there's always Ds. Now, um, proper time, the tau, is the amount of time between two events that for this one observer happen at the same place. The one guy for which those two events happen to occur at the same position or for whom the dx is zero. So yeah, that's the proper time. And this is time dilation, you're right. This is the formula. Uh, this is any random other guy who's moving with respect to the two events. Um, there was a, a, a comment just a second ago about inertial frames. I made a huge point last week about inertial frames, namely that special relativity only applies in inertial frames. And that is very true. Either of these two observers, or let's be more strict, both of these observers have to be in an inertial frame. The thing that they happen to be looking at, the thing that happens to be moving, does not. This is why special relativity, you are allowed to apply even when you're looking at things that are accelerating, as long as you yourself stay in an inertia frame. So how do you know that you're in an inertia frame? First, uh, internal. Yeah, Newton's first law. It tells you if you are in an inertia frame. If you find that things are not moving according to Newton's first law in your particular frame, that means you are not in an inertia frame. You are not allowed to use special relativity. So, 
Um, SRT, special relativity, only allowed in inertial frame. In this context, people tend to call these things Lorentz frames, but it's all the same thing. Uh, only allowed in inertial frames. And the check the criterion whether you are is Newton's first law. There you go. So, um, real story, true anecdote. I was uh, on the train once more a week or so ago, and it was during the evening hours. And there is this period if you go from uh, Maastricht to Amsterdam where you have almost no villages around the train track. So there's almost no lights. There's no freeways, there's no lights. And during evening hours, it's pitch black outside, and it's really hard to tell whether you are moving. And I was wondering, suppose that I'm on this train and I really want to know whether I am in an inertia frame or not. Now one thing I cannot do is look at the outside and see whether I'm going faster and faster with respect to the things outside. And even if I were allowed to do that, or able to do that, then I would still want to know if I'm in an inertial frame and the outside is accelerating backward or that uh, the outside world is in an inertial frame and I'm accelerating forward. So again, Newton's first law. How would I know? Throw something to the earth. Okay, what, and what would happen? If uh, you are accelerating, the thing will come towards you. Exactly. So you take one of these, uh, these strobe waffles that you buy from the rail catering guy, right? And you just throw it upward. Now, if it were an inertial frame, then that means that thing would try to move in a horizontal direction with the same velocity with, with which it left your hand. And that means if you yourself are R2, it would just drop down exactly in your hand again, exactly where, you're left, where it left. If you happen to be in an inertial frame, so you're accelerating and it has left your hand, then this thing will move, try to move forward, uh, Newton's first law, with a constant velocity, whereas you are accelerating and the thing will drop behind you. Now, at the moment I do that experiment, just take a strobe waffle if you want to know if you're in an inertial frame, just throw up a couple of strobe waffles. If, if they drop down back <laughs> uh, to the back, that means you're not in an inertial frame. Okay? Again, I'm stressing this point over and over, but Newton's first law really is the most important law in, in mechanics, even relativistic mechanics. It tells you what set of rules you're allowed to use. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, for either. Lawrence, contraction. All right. Lorentz contraction. Formula, maybe? Um, what's it again? I think we used L equals gamma over L naught. What was the other way around? Oh, this is what you said. <coughs> yes. Where uh, L zero is the length of the thing mm -hmm. when it's not moving. Okay, you're almost right. It's the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's the other way around. Switch around. Oh, the oh shit, yes. Uh. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, but otherwise, you're right. And L0 is yeah. the, the length of an object. Uh, Observed by someone at the same velocity of the object. Yes, exactly. So somebody's moving along with the object, or different way to put the same thing who is in, uh, for whom the thing is not moving. Yeah. So this is what we call then the proper length, typically. Anything else? Lawrence so I'll recap. We're going to the Lawrence invariance. Lawrence invariance. Oh, I love that one. What does it mean? Uh, like when two observers are moving with respect to uh, the events, and like to find out like what the time dimension is for the one. Mm. Um, are you talking about the Lawrence transforms? No. Lawrence invariance. That's the interval, right? No, it's not going to something else. That's uh, set of C, C squared, no. or oh. C, D, T prime. Okay. Squared, I would think, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about other, uh, other that's, that's the interval, no? Uh, yes. Uh, so this is not what you meant? No, I meant uh, C, uh, C times D, T prime, C to gamma, C to gamma, no, 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 no. brackets. Oh, that's I see. Okay. 
another transform. Yes. Uh, oh. No, but that's fine. That's fine. I mean, you have the right physics. It's just a terminology you're 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 mixing up. There is also a thing called Lorentz invariance. Mm -hmm. That's not this thing. You were talking about Lorentz transforms. But it's good that you mentioned Lorentz invariance because I'm going to use that one. In fact, it's going to be a cornerstone of today's lecture. A Lorentz transform, indeed. And you know by now that I always mess up my seeds because in my own calculation I put them to unity. In fact, we might actually discuss why we're going to do this today as well, just to get rid of this, uh, the, the pesky thing. Uh, but I think this is what you meant. Yeah. Oh, already messing up, I think, yes? Uh, yeah, V over C. Yes, is it V over C? Yes, that's the one. Okay. So what does this mean? It's not a test, I'm, I'm, but this is really just making sure that we're all on the same page. I'm going, going to use this extensively. In the meantime, let me already write down the other Lorentz transform. There you go. Um, wasn't this the case where both were moving? Uh, both what are moving? Um, both observers are moving. With respect to? To each other. Yeah. Well, but they're certainly moving with respect to each other, but there is an additional the condition. Both moving with respect to the events. Yes. But be sure here, events, events. Plural, plural, right? It's not a theory about events, about a single, one single event. It's a theory about events, distances and durations. And for those who need two moments in time, two positions in space. That's right. If both observers are moving with respect to two events, and one guy says, wait, I see those two events, a distance dx apart and a time duration dt apart. Then by this calculation, you can calculate how much the other guy sees them apart in time, dt, dt prime, and in space, dx prime. V in this context is the relative velocity between the two observers. Now, Important point here is that this only holds the way that I write it down now is at the moment that the two observers are move, moving with respect to each other in x direction. And as a result, the z's and the y's stay the same. So distance in y direction of the two events is the same for both observers, even though they're moving with respect to each other. Now if you want to know how they, these work in other directions, you can easily make the uh, proper adjustments, you don't have to. Because two observers are always in some coordinate system moving with respect to each other in x direction, right? If you find that they're not, just rotate your coordinate system in such a way that both of them are on a straight line in the x direction. So you can always apply this one. So there's no loss in generality if we're going to assume that they're always moving with respect to each other in x direction. Anything else? No electrodynamics so far, by the way. Wait, the, that Lorentz, is that the, the Dutch Lorentz? Yes, Hendrik Antel Lorentz, Nobel Prize 1902. Yes. Yeah, because there's two, right? Uh, there's a, yeah, that, that, that's true. There's a, well, there's actually three. There's an ornithologist, and there is a Danish guy called Lorentz. Uh, but the, the latter two are without the T spelled in the name. Uh, yes? Uh, I think the retarded potential. Ooh, yeah, there's retarded potential for the electrodynamics. Yeah. Okay, um, sure. Let me do it somewhere halfway here. Um, yeah, that's true. Do you know the physics? I mean, I can write down the equations. Not so important for today, but uh, do you know what, what it means physically, in essence? Um, when, like, uh, like the field changes? Yes. Like, the effect has on a certain position in space? Yes. And, like, the time delay? Exactly, exactly. Time delay, not dilation. That's a special relativistic effect. Um, if I change a little bit of field here, it will take a while before you feel it. Not because of special ability, simply because th there has to be distance travel, and it takes a little bit of time. And this is what Jaco did with you a couple of weeks ago. Um, let's not write down the full equations. Uh, I can, but it's not so important for today. All right. Still asking. Maxwell's equation. Yeah, of course. And these we are going to use extensively today, so let's be sure to have them all written down. Um, I'm sure you all know it by heart by now. There you go. That's one. Yes? Uh, how come that's not uh, important the retarded potential? Oh, but no, they are important in physics. Yeah, no, no, but like for this, I thought that uh, 
you would like to choose the gamma to be a result of potential and then choose that? Oh, so yes. Okay. Um, it's a good question. Um, let me finish the, the okay. Maxwell equations and I will come to your. It's a very good question, in fact. Because I just easily dismiss the required potential. It's not going to be important today. Well, of course, they're going to be important. If you're going to measure something about you, I have to take into account the channel time. Why don't I? Right? That's your question. So let me get back to it in a second. if we are going to drop the C's from now on, or should I just put them in? I'm, I'm happy with both. You can go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You can always easily squeeze them back in just by looking at the dimensions of the things. At some point you have done the calculation, you come to the other end, and suppose that you, what the, the thing that you were going to calculate is, say, an energy joule, but you find that Without the C's, you find that the thing that you found has the dimension of a joule divided by meter multiplied by second. Now you know that it should have been joules, and you can see that there is a dimension of there. All of a sudden, there is an inverse meter second in there. So that means that apparently the C that you're missing is C to the power one because that cancels exactly out those missing dimensions. So this is what theoretical physicists use just to get rid of the stupid C's. Again, if you don't want that, we can also just leave them in. Uh, be aware that I might make a little bit more mistakes than every now and then, but uh, I propose to leave them out. Now, there is an, uh, another reason for leaving them out, not just out of practicality, and that is that that C that we introduced, um, the way that I introduced it last week, uh, was that C is some conversion factor in front of the, the DT to make sure that everything that you add together in the Minkowski line element has the same dimension. Okay, and then I said, well, then it's also an experiment to determine whether something moves with that speed and what, what that thing is. It turned out to be the speed of light, amongst many other things. Now, that number for the velocity, of course, is completely arbitrary. Right? I mean, seriously, what is my length and my height? Take a guess. Just went to the passport uh, to the people this morning to get my new passport. Booked a flight two weeks ago, found out my passport was expired. So, yes, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. But, but but literally like three weeks ago or so, I got my first pass. I mean my, my previous passport I got in 2013 in February. Uh, so I have to tell these people what my height is. 183, okay? 1.83. Okay. Uh, imperial system. What is my height? Ish. Six foot one. Six foot one, I guess. I'm not sure, Scott. You? Mean Something like that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you're used to, I mean, originally you used this system, right? Yeah, I guess six one or something like that. Okay, so it's, it's the same height still, right? I mean, it's, it's still me and my, the amount of space that I take up in, in this direction. Uh, apparently, you can easily go from 6.1 or something like that to 1.83, depending on how you have chosen your units. I mean, nothing changes in your actual amount of space that you take in. Now, that means that you have a certain amount of freedom to choose how you're going to use your, 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 your units. Well, in that case, you might as well just choose a unit such that C happens to be exactly one in some coordinates, in some unit system. It's called the natural unit system, and that's what we use. So, again, we're going to drop the Cs from now on. Practicality, that's one. And secondly, it's really just a matter of how you choose your units. Now, as a result, that means that this C we're going to forget about, this C we're going to forget about, and this C we're going to forget about. Notice how beautifully symmetric these two things have become now. They look exactly the same. That's one. Uh, more Cs. Well, you might remember that epsilon zero and mu zero are connected to C in this way. Now we're going to put this equal to one in our new natural unit system. We just have to choose our epsilon zero dimensions and our mu zero dimension also is such a way that this ultimately get, gives you one. Uh, here's a possible choice. Epsilon zero is two, mu zero is one half. 
that works. You get one over square root of one, gives you one, that's perfect. Uh, guess what choice we're going to make from now on? <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> one, one. Yeah, one, one, exactly. Yeah. So there you go. Again, this is perfectly allowed. We're not changing any physics. We're not even changing any mathematics. The only thing we're doing is, well, you know, we're going to choose our units in a more conventional way. So there are some units dropped here, and there's a unit dropped here. Okay? Okay, uh, Louis, your question. Retarded potentials. Yeah. So I dismissed them. <laughs> I said, well, it's not important. It's not because it was Jakob who gave that lecture. <laughs> there was a, there's a different reason. And that is that um, what we're going to do is we're going to write everything in special relativistic terms. And in special relativistic terms, we're only interested in the time duration and not the delay because of travel time. Mm -hmm. So what physicists do when they think about these things is that instead of you changing your field and me waiting for a couple of seconds before it arrives here, mm -hmm. I'm going to pretend that I dropped one of my measuring apparatus exactly at your location, so that the moment that you do something or change your field, I see it immediately. I can easily do that, right? I don't have to stand here and wait for your information to get to me. I can also just drop my measuring apparatus out there and measure you right there on the spot and get and get get rid of all my time delay. Not time dilation, time delay effects. So when people do special with general relativity, they assume that the whole universe is filled with measuring apparatus at every point in time and every point in space. In such a way that all time delays are cancelled out, or not cancelled out, uh, they don't appear. Because everywhere that something happens, there happens to be a measuring apparatus to measure that number. This is why. Now, of course, in practical terms, we don't have that. In practical terms, I have only myself, maybe here, maybe I have two or two other of these measurement boxes. In that sense, in practical terms, I do have to take it into account. In theoretical terms, I don't. This is why I'm dismissing them. Um, anything else? Lorentz gauge electrodynamic. Yes, the Lorentz gauge. Maybe more generally speaking, gauges. Um, maybe two sentence synopsis of gauges? Uh, a test to see if your laws of physics are universal, I guess. When a you test to see if your, your laws of physics are universal? If you add on a little bit and see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm happy with that actually. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, so gauges, generally speaking, let me put it in relativistic or in electrodynamical terms here. Uh, in this particular case, the, the concept exists outside of electrodynamics. But for our particular application, a gauge is you're free to add to your vector potential and to your scalar potential in a particular combination in such a way that the E fields and B fields do not change. It, it's a long sentence to parse. So let me just write it down in explicit detail. Um, if you have your vector potential and you replace it by the vector potential uh, plus the gradient of any function. And at the same time, what you do is you take your scalar potential and you change that to the scalar potential minus the time derivative of that same function. Under the, these two combined changes of, of your vector potential and your scalar potential, your E fields and B fields will not change. You will have exactly the same theory, uh, predictions for experiments, the exact same amount of, of, of forces the particles feel. And a particular choice for lambda is called the gauge. Note, by the way, that when we did it before, it was an epsilon zero mu zero here. But in our new system, they've all been set to unity. Now, you made it much more general, the concept. You said something you can do to your mathematics, but that's not exactly the words that you use, but uh, universality of the laws of physics, something like that? OK. Well, there's also a gauge built in here, yes? Because you might remember from last week that I showed you that there are particular combinations of uh, observables in special relativity that do not change even if you go to some other guy's Lorentz uh, inertial system. So that too is a sort of gauge. There are numbers that if you go from one guy's inertial frame to another guy's inertial frame, that number will not change. A prime example maybe of, of such a number? 
a number that's going to be the same for all observers? Four vectors. Uh, not four vectors. Oh, four colors. Sorry? Four colors. Oh, four scalars. Oh, okay. Um, sure. I agree. In fact, we've got, that's, that's also something we're going to do extensively in a moment. But I'm being very suggestive here. The speed of light. The speed of light. That's the, the, the D prime example. There's more. Uh, mass. If you go to some other guy's inertial system, some guy's mass will not, will not have changed. And despite some popular science books about these things. So, yeah. Um, so that's, that's the type of gauge. Apparently, the speed of light is the same for all observers, even though they go to, from one inertial system to the other, which is exactly what you, in your language of universality of, of laws of physics, would call a gauge. You can gauge yourself to another guy's inertial system without changing these particular numbers. So there's really two gauges that we have seen so far. Um, this particular one, there was one that we called the Lorentz gauge, this one without the T. And that's when somebody, I'm guessing it was Lorentz without the T, said, you know what, let's choose our lambda in such a way that uh, the divergence of your A field is exactly equal to minus the time derivative of the uh, scalar field. So again, you're free to choose your lambdas in such a way in under these transformations without changing your physics. And then Lorentz, without the T, came up with the idea, well, there's probably a lambda that makes sure that you can do this. And if you do that, your physics becomes extremely simple. You might remember what it is. Because then all of a sudden, the equations for the scalar field and the vector field become extremely simple, the, the differential equations. Again, dropping my epsilon zeros and mu zeros. But under the Lorentz gauge, uh, this is wrong, excuse me. Uh, this is correct. Remember this that if you do the Lorentz gauge, then the differential equation for the A field becomes this. The differential equation for your scalar field, phi, becomes exactly that same thing with a row, we did this explicitly to show that this is the case. Uh, originally there was a one over c squared here, and I dropped that one because it's all unity now. The nice thing about this step, once we got here, was that apparently in all of electrodynamics, your A field and your phi field will always obey this differential equation. So if somebody gives you the general solution to this thing, you have solved all of electrodynamics. And I actually gave you what the solution was, but we're not going to be bothered with it today. Okay, it's somewhere in your notes, and it's also in the book, chapter 10. Okay, anything else? Maybe a Minkowski invariance. All right. Yes, the Minkowski invariance. This is... Indeed, what some people call Lorentz invariance. So there was the mix up in terminology there. Minkowski or Lorentz invariance, now with a T, means that there is. Well, what does it mean? <laughs> um, <coughs> well, I know the formula, but okay. it's hard to phrase it. Let's, try. Let's, let's, let's just try. Um, means that um, in a space time, mm -hmm. um, if you are at your space and your time, you get you always get the same. And like you should all, like the, in all frames, you would always get the same result. Okay, something like that. You're right. What we did before was we showed again dropping the scenes that. This particular combination of numbers. Did I do it like this before with the minus signs at this place? Or did I put the minus sign here and then plus this? Yeah, no, this is the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Uh, this particular combination of some guys' duration and some guys' distances for two events is the same for all observers. So some other guy comes along and he calculates his dt and his dx and dy's and dz's, let's put them with a prime, for the same two events, and he puts them together in this particular combination, he will get exactly that same number. And what I did last week was that I started with that statement and then derived all special relativity from it, including all these, these energy equations and such. What's the expression? Not to be the dead horse or something like that. Um, but I would like to emphasize once more that the nice thing about this particular derivation, starting with this thing, the invariance of d tau, gives you all special relativity without thought experiments, without the details of your experiment. There's not even no light involved anymore. There's a speed of light involved, but there's no light involved. And most importantly, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it in those terms last week, it has reduced all special relativity now to just the relation between space and time, and nothing else. Because that is what special relativity is. It's not a theory about light, it's not a theory about trains or mirrors, it's a theory about space and time. So by getting everything back to the relationship between space and time with this conspicuous minus sign, you, mo you have the most clean derivation of special relativity. Yes, this thing is called invariant. The, the fact that it's the same number for everybody makes it an invariant. And here's the most important thing of last week, I think, and what we're going to use extensively now, that if you have two four vectors, any two four vectors, doesn't matter which, which they are, let's call them A and uh, B, I think last week we used V and W, and I said omega all the time, let's call them A and B now, not to be confused with scalar potential and magnetic field, any two four vectors, then this particular combination, invariant, regardless of what A is and what B is. One condition though, both have to be four vectors. So this thing is Lorentz invariant, provided are four vectors. Do you remember what the four vector is? It's, it's not any four numbers in column, They're, they come with a special property. They need to follow Lorentz transform. Exactly. So that if I have some combination of four observables, things that I can measure, and I ask you to measure the same things, and we have to be moving with respect to each other with velocity v, then my numbers should be transformable to your numbers by Lorentz transform. If so, those four numbers are called a four vector. Now, under that condition, this particular combination is invariant. Okay, well, um, I think. Is there anything else? Are we complete now? I'm sure there's many things more. Right, there's the Gauss law, there's the Biot-Savart law and such. We're not going to be bothered with these things. So this, I think, summarizes everything that we're going to need for today. Um, any questions? Because now it's about time they're going to start with the new, uh, the new start. By the way, can somebody be timekeeper today? Because I so easily go over time extensively. So somebody has to watch a clock for me. Anyone? Well, if not, they're going to go over time. I mean, that's, that's fine too. So it's, for, it's, for, it's in your own interest that somebody speaks up. Just let me know by the time you think it's break time, okay? I'll try to do it myself too, but if I forget, then I'm going to blame you. Okay, here's the new stuff. This is really what we're going to do. We're going to combine all of this into all of this. Now last week, so here's where the new stuff begins. Last week I said, well, there's a certain type of notation that's really advantageous if you know how that works. I started one of the derivations last week in that new notation and I thought, no, the notation is actually much more heavy than the thing I want to prove. That was this thing, if you remember. Then I stepped back and did it without the new notation. I am going to use the new notation. Um, it's part of uh, the cultural tradition that you know how that notation works, but it's, it's really out of practicality. So consider what follows now, just a mathematical notation thing. Now once we've gotten used to this, we will really combine these two, two things to each other. Um, 
One piece of notation I already introduced last week. A four vector, again I'm going to call it A, not to be confused with the vector potential, scalar potential, is a combination of four numbers. And for historical reasons, they're called A0, A1, A2, A3. These two things. Now, again, you already mentioned this before yourselves, but at the moment the Dissing transforms to U via Lorentz transform. The Dissing is called a Vore vector. So let's make it explicit. Suppose that some other guy is going to measure the same four numbers or the same observed, the same physics, the same events. But he's moving with respect to me with velocity v in x direction. He will measure generally different numbers for these four components of the four vector. What are these numbers in formula? This is something you should, if you think about it for, for a moment, you should be able to put into detail. Gamma bracket <laughs> A zero okay. minus A. Remember that? Yeah. And this thing then will be this. It's exactly the same transformations when instead of saying T or DT and DX, I am now writing A1 and A0. Now these two do not change because I assumed, without a loss of generality, as I mentioned before, that the two observers are moving in x direction with respect to each other. Okay? Now, if this is true, then a, a mu is a four vector. If this is not true, if this does not hold, a mu is just a co combination of four numbers in the column, but not a four vector. Okay, great. So here's one piece of new notation. When I put mu on top of the thing, I mean all these four components, and I usually don't even write out this anymore. I just write a mu, and it's up to you to understand that I mean all four of these things. Okay? Now let's go to this one. This important rule that we derived before, I am also going to write in a new notation. Namely as follows. Um, let me just copy this for a second. In fact, just to connect better with the book, I'm giving everything an overall minus sign. I'm not changing anything, by the way. I'm just saying that instead of looking at that expression, I'm going to look at minus that expression. I hope you understand that if that thing is invariant, then minus that thing is also invariant, yes? The only reason that I do this is just to connect better with the book that used this particular convention. Here's the new notation. I'm going to write this as follows. I'm going to introduce two summations and two Greek letters mu and nu. Now so far, do you have any difficulty knowing what these things mean? Forget about this strange new symbol here. Do you have difficulty reading this? Okay. This means, the first one just means take mu, give it the value zero, then take mu, give it the value one, two, three, you get four numbers, add them together. Do the same thing with mu, this one here. Okay? But I've been squeezing something else, this thing here. Now, I'm sure you've seen this in other contexts before. This is what we call the Minkowski metric. And what the thing does for you, is keep track of this minus sign. If I would leave this out, this thing, then these, this double summation would just tell you A0 times B0 plus A1 times B1 plus A2, B2, A3, B3, add everything together. And their combinations, A0, B1, A2, B3. Now, in this particular combination, first of all, not all combinations exist. A0, B3 does not appear in the combination. Most importantly, 
the A0, B0 has to come with an additional minus sign. Now keeping track of that minus sign and making sure that I'm not going to add combinations 0, 3, 1, 2 and such, this thing is introduced and that thing is written as a matrix, like this. It's all just notation. Now you can see that this thing comes with itself two of these indices, mu and u, and they count whether you are in what row and what column of the matrix you are. This one here is column zero. Or, if you will, mu is zero because mu is the column. This is mu is one. This column is mu is two. This one is mu is three. There's also a new, and the new are the rows. So this one, I'm going to do it in blue. The first row, for historical reasons, is called the zeroth row, mu is zero. This one is called mu is one, mu is two, and here's mu is three. There you go. Now my claim is that under this new notation, having introduced this Minkowski matrix, as, is, 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 as it is called, or if you want to be more puristic about it, the Minkowski metric, make sure that the minus sign gets at the right place and the plus signs get at the right places. My claim is this expression is exactly that expression using this new notation. Now, showing that that is the case, I would like to do the exercise session later. Okay. But you, maybe you can already see what happens there. We're going to see later that that is the case. Now, Einstein, who wrote all down all these things, well, in fact, it was actually Hermann Minkowski who took his general his special relativity and turned it into a matrix type of uh, mathematics, decided at some point, you know what? It's sort of superfluous to write down these summation signs all the time. Let's just all agree with each other implicitly that at the moment that you see one mu downstairs and one mu upstairs, implicitly that means you have to sum over these things. And the same thing with the mu's. If you see one Greek index down and one Greek index up, that means summation. And from now on we're not going to write down the summation. So dropping the, the summation signs, I, not, drop, not dropping any terms, not dropping any mathematics, just the notation. This is how from now on we are going to write expressions like this. So two steps of new notation here. Step one is, I've introduced the Minkowski matrix here to keep track of the minus sign. Second piece of new notation, we're going to drop the, the summation signs from now on. And if you get used to this notation, you're extremely happy that Einstein brought this into the world. Because you don't have to constantly write down all the summation signs, let alone all the five million terms that you typically have in these, these combinations. Now this thing is called a contraction. That's just the way that we call that thing. Contraction means take the four vectors, squeeze the Minkowski metric in front, and then do all these summations. Just to be sure that nobody misunderstands, a contraction is not a multiplication. Okay? Let me give you an example. Something that is not correct. In fact, because for that reason, let me write it in red. Some guy comes along and he has this particular contraction, the one that we just wrote down. And in his physics he finds that it's equal in some context to his other contraction. Right? Suppose that you have some situation where you find that this thing is that thing. Now if this were a multiplication, you would say, aha, I see a number here, I see a number there. I can just, uh, 
cancel that out. That doesn't work. It's not a multiplication. It's a multiplication for each term and then everything added together. And just like in a sum of things, you can not just cancel out all of the different coefficients of every term, you cannot cancel this one out. Here's another example of something you cannot do. Here's this guy again. And he has found this, and in his physics he finds that this thing is equal to... Suppose that his context says that this is true. Guess what you cannot do? Take out the... Yeah. Exactly. You cannot take these out. This is wrong, what I'm doing, okay? If you write these things out on both sides, you can easily tell that this is not the case. The reason I'm making a point out of this is because you might be tempted to cross out things left and right. That works with multiplications. It does not work with contractions. Again, I haven't introduced anything else. I've just said that that's this thing and this thing in the new notation are just the same expression. That's all. Later on, <laughs> we're going to write this out and actually see that that is the case. So I hope that will convince you. Well, let's see if we can take some of our expressions here and write them into this new notation. Black. Maybe you know one? Something you can write as a contraction expression we've seen before. I've already done one. I've done this one. I've written this one as a contraction. Mankowski. Help me, help me, help me. You, you, uh, so you want me to say what it would look like? Um, no, I want to know what you're talking about. Your uh, Mikowski variants. This one. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So how? Okay. And then now tell me, please, what, what it would look like. Um, so uh, would you keep the d tau squared still? Sure. That's just the name of that thing. Okay. Um, and you will have this new symbol. Um, and you will have an a for the. Uh, time and an A for the space, a B for the space. Um, this is where you and I start disagreeing, I think. Uh, but you are right, you can write this in this particular combination. So, uh, let me just give you the answer, and then you can check for yourself that this is the case. Here's a four vector, right, by this notation that I have there. And by this four vector, I mean dt, dx, dy, dz, four numbers. Oh, wait, 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 I say it's a four vector. Is this a four vector? Or is it just a column of four numbers? There's a criterion to tell you whether something is a four vector. It's invariant. Sorry? It's invariant. Uh, this thing is, itself is not invariant. A vector cannot be invariant. A scalar can be invariant. A number. What's the criterion to see whether something, a column of four numbers, is a four vector? Lorentz. Yes, if it transforms via Lorentz. Now, does this thing transform via Lorentz transform? Yes, that's a yes. Here it is. And you can see that a dt primed is a Lorentz transform of the other dt in dx. So it, you, would, you, you could call it the prime example of a four vector. So it is a four vector. Okay, that's good. Claim. If we have defined it like this, then my claim is d tau squared in the new notation is this thing. Y x. What do you mean x? Y uh, this x? D x, yeah. That's this notation. I mean, there is a dt in there. There's a dx, dy, dz. You have to give it a name, and people have decided to call it dx mu. There, there's no physics. It doesn't relate to the dx in the... No, no, the, no, I understand completely what you mean. This dx seems to imply there's something with this dx because it's the same symbol. 
uh, I fully understand, but it isn't the same symbol because this is dx without an index, and this is dx with an index. It means the whole thing. But I mean, I can understand the confusion. I was just making sure. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So it's it's it's. I mean, you could all also have called it dt mu, and then I wouldn't have meant this dt. I just all, would still have meant the whole thing. Claim. If you write this out using our new notation, you would just get back this invariant thing. You can already sort of see how that works, right? Do you feel like we should do this, maybe? Just see how it works? Just no? Sure. I see some people, yes, some people, no. Let's just do it for completeness. All right, remember, just notation-wise. This means take all mu's, give them the value 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm going to be very explicit now. So it means, forget about the new for now. We're just going to do summation over the, the mu first, this summation first. This gives us dx. It means take mu, give it its value 0. So that makes this one dx 0. This one is still dx nu. Plus, oh, excuse me, minus. Now you take mu the value 1. Right, because that's what the notation means. Yes. Why is it uh, minus second is not plus since we changed the symbol? Uh, th th this thing will make sure that the minus is getting the wrong place. Yeah. So should the other one not be plus? No. Uh, at the moment that I fill in what the value is of my matrix, yeah. I haven't done that yet. Oh, so okay. this minus is just the overall minus still. Okay. But in a moment, you're right. My matrices will give you the minuses and the pluses at the right place. The only thing I'm doing now is just taking exactly what it says here, taking my mu to be every value and add everything together. So if my mu is 1, this one, then this one is also 1. So it gives us dx1, and this one is still d nu. Now, let me continue a little bit faster now. I've now just done the summation over the nu's. Okay. Okay, halfway there. We still have the summation over the news. Okay. Now beware now. Because this thing alone has four values from you, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it gives you four terms. So this thing will now split up in four more terms. For every new, there has to be one, one, uh, one term. So this one I will split up if I write it out explicitly in four extra terms. But this one has its own summation of news, four more terms. Another four, another four gives you 16 terms in total. Um, this is why we don't do this. This is why you have this notation. So we don't have to write every, all that crap out, okay? In general relativity, it becomes worse because there you have objects that have more than two indices. Four is not an exception. Now, four of these indices, each of which can have four different values, 0 to 3, is 4 to the power 4. That's an enormous amount of terms that you're writing out. So we don't do that. We have this new notation. Fortunately, we can go a little bit faster here. We, we, if you want, feel free to write out the notation, the, the new uh, summation here and here and here. It gives you all these 16 terms in total. Let's be a little bit more clever here. Remember that this one means which row you're in, the first row. Do you notice that the first row, that's this one, has zeros at the other columns? Let me be explicit here. Mu zero only has a non-zero uh, value at the moment that nu is also zero. Do you see that? So if I would take, for instance, the term uh, zero one and then dx nu with nu 1. Then I would have here uh, this thing, 0th row, first column. 0th row, first column would have given me a 0. So that one will drop out. Right? These things multiply what comes out. If, if those numbers in the matrix happen to be 0, that term does not appear in the full term, in the full expression. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm going to be very smart. I'm not going to write out all the terms. I'm just going to write down the terms that I can just tell by a glance are not going to give me zeros. In this particular case, the only column, the only new in my 
first row, my zeroth row, is when the column is also zero, when u is also zero. So the only term that survives this contraction is this one. Now in a moment I'm going to fill in what the, what the values are. Let's just keep it for now. Question, which new in the first row is going to survive? Which column in the first row? First row. Sorry? In the first row? Yes, because this term says oh. mu has to be one, so that's the first row, that's this one. No, the second row. That's okay. And no, I mean, I know, I mean that second term is the one that it's going to survive. Yes, okay. So that's this one, right? Uh, which mu is that? What mu value? One. Four. Yes. Yeah, because we start counting at zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so first row, first column, this one. All the other terms just give you zero times your d-axis, do not contribute. But that means that nu is now also one, gives you this. Now if you play this game a little bit more with the remaining terms, you can easily convince yourself that in this one nu has to be two. But if nu is two, then this is dx2. And in the last one, nu has to be three, because it's the three, three one that is non-zero. Okay. We have now done the two, done the two summations. What is the zeroth row, zeroth column value? Minus one. That's minus one. So we're just going to read off what this value is, minus one, along with this additional minus that came from the overall one, gives you plus one, and dx zero, we call that dt, yes? But we have two of them, dt squared. dt squared. So this one is now taken care of. How about this one? See you gesturing. It's minus dx. Okay. It's minus dx squared, yes. Because uh, this, this, the first row, first column of the matrix, that's this one, gives you plus one. With the overall minus sign here, it gives you minus one. dx1 is what we call dx squared. dx squared. And if you continue the game, you get this. So we found in our new notation that d tau squared is this particular combination. And, and, and that's true, right? Here it is. Again, I haven't done any physics. The only thing I've done is taken the expression that I, I already knew, this one, and I wrote it in this particular form. And in these steps I've shown you that really is the same thing in this new notation. I hope you're starting to appreciate why we like this notation and not this one. <laughs> Question. You know that this thing is invariant, yes? because that was a starting point. But this is maybe an argument why you can see just from this alone that it should be an invariant. We've now written it as this. Why is this invariant? Apart from me telling you so. Because it's a contraction of two four vectors? Exactly. We've already seen, that's how we started, that this is a four vector. And a contraction of two four vectors here is always invariant. That's what we proved last week. Every time that you see a four vector with a mu and a four vector with a mu and a Minkowski matrix in front, that thing is going to be invariant. The value is going to be different from person to person for the A's and the B's. This contraction, this combination will be the same. Well, that's what we have here. A contraction, two four vectors, and a Minkowski matrix, sure, and a minus sign. So that's an invariant. So in this notation, you can at a glance immediately see when something is an invariant or not. If it's a contraction, invariant. Don't even think about it anymore. That's what we proved last week. Time. Break? Sure. Okay. This might be my coffee cup of last week. Something else that I also realized that today is 
Einstein's birthday. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Yes. And International Pi Day. Uh, that too. Yes. 3.14. Yes. And I said before at the beginning, well, not everybody is present still, that at 3, that gives us another 15. 3.14, 14, 14, 15. It's two, two extra digits. So at, at in 15, 17 minutes from now, we're, we're going to celebrate this for a second, okay? Okay. Because we're closer to Pi. <laughs> and who doesn't like Pi? Okay. Uh, Do you have some pie to celebrate? I, I wish I, I, I wish I had. Does anyone bring some pie? Did anyone bring pie? No. Does anyone want to pick up some pie? Maybe. There's no time. Two minutes away. So. Okay. okay. You know that actually sounds like a plan for in between the uh, after the, the main lecture and we go to the tutorial. Right. That that sounds like a pie. Like, okay. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see what we have here. Um, yeah, so it's all just a, everything that's, that's written here, written now in terms of four vectors and this particular new contraction thing. Again, the advantage here is at the moment that you see somebody write out A mu, B mu, B mu, and a Minkowski metric in front, uh, you know that that thing is going to be invariant. The A's and the B's might be different from one person to the next, but this particular combination is going to be the same. Unless some joker comes along and he just wrote four numbers in a column and called it a mu without it being a four vector. In that case, it doesn't hold. Now, uh, we don't have this many jokers in special relativity. So just assume if you see an a mu, it's an actual four vector, okay? Okay, now there's one thing on the board that we have not written yet in terms of this new notation. Forget about the uh, relativistic uh, the dynamics part. There's some stuff over here, and some stuff we have written in terms of the u's and the u's, but some stuff we have not. Oh, sure, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. We haven't even written it over there, but as one more example of something that is invariant, last week I showed you that this thing, again, dropping dropping the C's. First of all, this is a four vector. I've shown you explicitly before. How did I know that? Because it was really just this thing, which we know is a four vector, times m divided by d tau. Now, dividing by d tau and multiplied by m will not change the four vectorness of this thing. So if this is a four vector, then this thing is two. And last week, in our new notation, I showed you that the contraction of two of these relativistic momentum four vectors gives you an invariant, and I think the invariant that we saw was mc, or mc squared. Which one was it? mc. And then dropping the c's. Okay? Again, what you see here is that m is an invariant that it does not change from person to person. As it sounds even like when I look at you, because you just made that one comment last week. I'm sorry, I'm just going to drop it from now on, okay? You're not representative of that school of thought. Thanks. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, sure, this is all true. No, what I meant was, uh, we haven't written the Lord's transforms. You can also write them in this new notation. So here's another example. I want to know some other guy's dx mu. So and again. With the mu, I mean all four of these components. I'm just going to give the answer. You can easily check for yourself that this is the case, that what I'm writing down, down now is true. I've introduced this thing that I in very briefly uh, introduced last week as well, the Lorentz matrix, right? This big lambda. Last week, I did not put the indices there. Because then at this, that was exactly the moment that we decided, let's not go uh, in this particular way, because of notation uh, issues. Um, but one thing we did do last week was write down what the matrix was. Maybe you recall what it was. It was gamma, minus gamma v, minus gamma v, gamma, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Again, drop the C's. This is the matrix that we derived last week, the Lorentz matrix. Claim. If you do this summation, there's one contraction there, 
just open news, only one summation. New is zero, new is one, new is two, new is three. Get four terms, add them everything together. You will get exactly these four equations. If you want, we can write it down uh, out later to see that's really true. So even the four Lorentz transforms have now become extremely simple. Note that these are four equations. Because we're summing over the news, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So what you have on this right-hand side is really is four terms added together right, in contraction notation. But the mu itself can still have this value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is, this is four equations, each of which has four terms on the right-hand side. Why four equations? Because mu can have four values. Why four terms? Because the contraction dictates that you should add over the news. Four equations, each of four terms. My claim is those four equations are exactly these four. If you want, we can write it out, out later to see that that's really the case. All right, now, now that we've done all of this, we've rewritten everything here in terms of the new notation. Maybe not this one and not this one, but we saw last week that these two are really just a special case of this more general one, okay? So once we have this, we have everything. Everything that's here now is now here. This is a new notation. Okay, so far the new notation part. Close to three yet? Ten minutes, okay. I haven't done anything with my electrodynamics so far. But this notation is extremely good to put all of this into four vector notation and contractions. Can I erase this? Because this I'm going to need this. I hope you have on your notes right now. So, so far, the new notation. Does it look daunting to you? I mean, is, is, is it, I mean, does it look difficult? It might look difficult, but it's, it's not actually difficult. Again, if once you get used to it, you're extremely happy with this notation because it spares you writing out 16 terms every time that you see a contraction. There's another reason why this notation is extremely important, and that is that in general relativity, the same mathematics holds. The only thing you have to change to turn this into general relativity is change the Minkowski metric. The mu nu in Minkowski metric is either minus 1, 1, 1, 1, or 0. In general relativity, uh, depending on the context, how much gravity there is, the numbers in that matrix change significantly. They might even be functions, depending on how close you are to, say, a black hole or a neutron star. But everything else stays exactly the same. So once you have mastered this new notation, you also have, quote unquote, mastered general relativity. Okay? Or you know, at least you know immediately how to write everything that you know in special relativity immediately in terms of general relativity. So, For the people interested in that, feel free to join the general relativity course in period five. So that means that you might already have an advantage because I'm going to tell the same story again by that time. Here's electrodynamics in, in terms of new notation. What I'm going to do, I could derive everything from scratch. What I'm going to do is the opposite route, and just going to give you the answers, and then we're going to check that they are true. Okay? Here's one. Remember that I before said a mu, don't confuse this with the actual vector potential. By now I mean the vector potential. This thing, this particular combination of four numbers, the scalar potential and then the three components of the vector potential, we call a mu, is a four vector. I'm claiming this now, I haven't proven it yet, but I promise I'm going to postulate these things and then prove that they're true. This is a four vector. In other words, it transforms on the Lorentz transformations. So that's nice. You know, it's also a four vector. A derivative. 
I've written down four derivatives now. Because mu could be zero, then that's a time derivative. It could be one, that's an x derivative, a two, a y derivative, or a three, that's a z derivative. So there's four derivatives now. Claim. Let me write it down in detail. This thing is also a four vector. You have to prove this, that this is the case. Now this one I will prove for you in a moment. This one you will have to prove for yourself. But if you know how a chain rule works in just calculus, you should be able to figure out how that works. Claim, this is a four vector. There's a slight rub though. It's a distinction I have not made and I will not pursue here, but four vectors themselves come in two varieties called covariant four vectors and contravariant four vectors. It's all very uh, difficult ways of saying that one of them transforms via Lorentz transform, and the other one via an inverse Lorentz transform. Remember, if what you do when you do a Lorentz transform is take my numbers, I'm moving now, I'm taking yours as an example again, you take my numbers that I measure and you calculate what his numbers are going to be for the same phenomena. Okay, going from my numbers to his numbers, you can call a Lorentz transform by this rule. What you could also do is take his numbers and calculate what my numbers would be. Right? That's an inverse Lorentz transform. Just a matter of who do you start with and whose numbers are you calculating. From one to him, that's a Lorentz, and from him back to me, that's an inverse Lorentz. Would you know just from physics alone, forget about the mathematics and the derivations, how the inverse Lorentz transform would look? It's this ish, but not really. Right? This is me take my numbers, dt, dx, calculate his. How would you take his numbers, calculate mine? Yes. Just is isolate dt. Sorry? Like isolate dt. Uh, you could, yeah, that's, that's good. That, that's how you would do it mathematically, yes. You have two equations here that have a dt, and what you want to have is dt equals something, something, something. And you want to do the same with the dx. Now you have two equations here with the unknown dt and dx. Two equations, two unknowns. And you can solve that algebraically. And you get an answer. Let me write down the answer, the inverse Lorentz transform. And maybe, so I'm going to write dt, my dt in terms of his measure, d ta, dt prime, dx prime. And I'm going to use your trick, I'm not going to do the algebra, but this is what you would get if you, you would do it. You would solve this for dt and dx, you would get this. It's the same thing, but with a plus sign. Does that make sense to you? V is our respective velocity, yes? You take my numbers, you want to calculate his, I see how fast we're moving with respect to each other, that's V. Now if he wants to do the same to me, then he sees me moving the other way with minus V. So if you do the math in using your suggestion, isolate dt and dx, if you do the math you would find this. But even with just from a physics standpoint you say, wait a minute, the only difference between me and him is that we're moving in opposite direction. Now, either you do it by the physics way or by the mathematics way, in both cases you will get this as the inverse transform. Here's the rub. I told you there's two types of four vectors. Again, I'm not going to pursue the matter because that's a whole field by itself. He's going to mention one thing. This is a four vector that in correct terminology we call contra, uh, excuse me, covariant four vector. This transforms via Lorentz, just as we have seen before. This is my claim. You have to puzzle on this to show this for yourself. It's a contravariant four vector. It's still a four vector, it still transforms via Lorentz transform, but by inverse Lorentz transform. Because this one now don't, don't take my word for this, you can prove this rigorously. It's not a hard exercise. This is something I would like to discuss with you either today or tomorrow morning, how you, how you do this. Just take it as a fact for now, okay? And again, terminology, covariant, contravariant. Okay. 
good. Um, I was in the business of just postulating a couple of things and then prove later on that all these things are true. Here's another one. Remember that we uh, had the charge density and the current. Dropping C's and such in mu zeros and epsilon zeros. This one gave you electric fields by the first Lorentz, uh, by the first Maxwell equation. And these currents J in I, Y, X, and Z direction gives you current, gives you magnetic fields. Claim this particular combination is also a four vector of the covariant type. The one that transforms via Lorentz, not inverse Lorentz. So again, this is a four vector. Again, we're going to prove this later on. For now, I'm just postulating that this is all true. Transforms via Lorentz. Or maybe somebody has an idea how, how you can see that these things must be four vectors. If not, I can fully imagine. The book, chapter 12, paragraph 12.3, does it by taking a thought experiment. Well, suppose you have this capacitor in this way, you uh, put a piece of coil around it and let a charge go through it and such, then you can prove that such and such and such. Now, you know me by now, this is a, a thought experiment. You take one particular example, you get a rule out of this, and then you say, oh, this is probably the rule for everything. I don't like that kind of reasoning, so I'm going to do it in, in a different way. <coughs> okay? It's not wrong, by the way. It's just the same with the trains in the mirrors. It gives you one example, and then you promote the, the results to a universal rule. I don't like that kind of reasoning. But then again, what do I know? OK. Uh, just a couple of test exercises. How about this? I'm taking this four vector, and I'm taking this four vector, put the Mikoski matrix in front of that. Don't ask me what, what the physics is of this new thing that I'm getting, but I'm going to get a number out. What do I know immediately about, about the number, even if I have no idea what that number means? Yes, please. Invariant. It's invariant. So even though my charges and my currents are different than yours, and my vector fields and scalar fields are different than yours, this combination is going to be the same for us both. If I measure four for this combination, this contraction, you measure four. Immediately, without thinking, just by, by this rule that we proved before in the new notation. So that's great. Perfect. Now, how about this one? Another example. Same. Invariant? Invariant, right? Yes. Because this is a four vector? Yeah. Sure. Of the other type, the one that transforms in the other direction, but it's still a four vector. And this is a four vector, then this thing what comes out has to be the same for all. Okay? Again, immediately. Now, the example that I wrote down before with the JMU and then what, I, what did I write down? The AU or something like that? Um, that one I just made up. It's some physics thing. Okay, I have no idea what that is. I just know that it's invariant. This thing does have an interpretation for me. In fact, let's ask ourselves the question: We know it's invariant. What is that number that should be the same for all? Maybe we can already guess what it is. But sorry. Probably something with the speed of light. Is it in Lorentz gauge? No. Sorry? Lawrence gauge. Oh, Lawrence gauge. Oh. <laughs> yeah, let me get back to that in a second. But you're right, there is something ish there, yes? Uh, some number will come out, and I know that the number is going to be the same for all, given that these two are four vectors. Well, let's just write it out, just to see what happens. Now, the Notation that we have says take mu is zero, take mu is one, two, three, add everything together. Let's do this. Mu zero 
is uh, derivative with respect to time. And then this also has to be zero because that's what the notation means. J zero is this one. Plus, no minuses. Minuses you get at the moment that you introduce a Minkowski metric. No Minkowski metric there. This is pluses. Okay. Uh, hmm. Mu is 1, gives you x1. That's this derivative with respect to x. I know the confusion is crappy because you say dx mu, and apart from that, there's dx. What can you do? <laughs> and you have to do this for j with mu is 1, which is jx, the current in x direction. And if you continue this game, then this thing written out is, just gives you this. Same thing, different notation. Oh, Was that the sound of understanding? Sorry? Continuity. Continuity equation. Do you see it happening now? Because what we have here should be some number. Can you just from physics know what that number is? Isn't it zero? Why would it be zero? Because the continuity equation is divergent of uh, your current density uh, equals minus change in density. Okay. Charge density. Yes, you're right. You remember from before, you have something called the continuity equation. If charge is uh, is, is, is changing in time at this, at, at this particular point in space, then that means current has flown away through space. So the continuity equation, just from physics alone, just understanding what continuity means, that you cannot just have charge missing somewhere, is this. Okay, we've seen this before, and you can easily uh, check for yourself that this is the case. Not because of the calculation, just because of the physics content of that thing. It just says, if charge just goes missing here, in time, it must have moved through space. That's all that it says, with the minus sign because it's flowing away. Yes? So is this how, it, how that equation was originally uh, derived? Mm. No. Uh, I'm taking a sort of backward approach <coughs> to this. I'm giving you the solution. I mean, I start, I'm saying, look, it's a continuity equation, and then show you uh, what else follows from this. Yeah. Uh, in the original approach, or the approach you see in many textbooks, uh, they start with, with just special relativity, and then they prove that this is the case. Again, it's just a matter of what is the starting point, what is your end point. So, historically, is, is that where, how it was originally derived, the continuity? I, I, think, I think so, because this relates, this one, this statement here, <coughs> doesn't come from mathematics or even from special relativity. This comes from the from conservation of charge, yeah, okay. which was known before special relativity. So, I would think that this is the way that they went. It's the way that I went when I uh, prepared this lecture a couple of weeks ago because I typically do this with the books close to see how far I get without looking at the books. And this is the way that I went. Because um, if we just know from understanding what charge conservation means, that this is this. Or if you will, this plus this is zero. What should this number be? That's zero. Okay. Now, just so, so you understand how my reasoning goes. I've made a claim that this thing is a four vector. This thing you can prove that it's a four vector, I will leave that to you, okay? And we can do this tomorrow if you want in detail. Suppose that you wouldn't know that this is a four vector. You just know it's, it's, a, it's a column of four numbers. And you suggestively call it a four vector because of the mu. Suppose that you don't know that it's a four vector, but you do know from physics that it should be zero. Should it be zero just for me or for everybody? Everybody. Charge conservation should hold for all observers. So, but that means that zero here, this number that comes out, is an invariant. It should be zero for all observers. Even if you go to some other guy's inertial frame. Here's my claim. We've seen before that a contraction of two four vectors if they are four vectors, will give you an invariant, yes? 
I have now a contraction of a four vector with something else, and it gives me an invariant. What should this be in order to make that hold? A four vector. So I've proven now that J mu, that I've defined as such, must be a four vector. Otherwise, charge conservation would not have held in all observers, for all observer frames. Conclusion, J mu, four vector. Um, should I write this down or in, uh, with, with actual words? Or do you see the reasoning here? I'm going to go with the words. Okay. So this is my reasoning. This thing comes from charge conservation. Forget special relativity, four vectors, contractions. Just charge conservation. Call it an experimental fact. Constant charge conservation. This should hold for all observers. So for all inertia frames. Okay. So that means that this that this is zero should hold for all observers in all inertia frames. In other words, I know that it's invariant. It happens to be zero, but whatever value, it has to be invariant. It's zero for all, all observers. Then I make the claim, well, I have an invariant, and it's a contraction of a four vector with this other thing, and the only way that I can get an invariant is a contraction of a four vector with another four vector. Conclusion, J mu must have been a four vector all along. That, that's the reasoning here. So J mu must be a four vector. So that's the actual way of knowing that J mu is a four vector, or can it also be derived the way that we will derive the, the um, wait, what is it? The other four vector is a four vector. Uh, um, yeah, there's other ways of deriving it as well, but it, it, it's just a matter of what is your starting point of your argument. Uh, the, the, way that, the reason that I took this is just for didactical reasons, because I think it's easier to understand for public who is new to this type of reasoning, to understand that the charge conservation is, uh, is true in all observer frames, and then derive this in four vector. There's another way of doing it, which is much more technical, and it comes from quantum field theory, the arc equation. And, uh, but that's nice, because that means in quantum field theory, um, you can prove without charge uh, uh, conservation that J mu is a four vector. And as a result, you have proven the charge is conserved. And of course, as a theoretical physicist, that's the way that I like best, because I, haven't, I don't have to put less uh, experimental fact in. <laughs> okay, good. So this one is checked. This is indeed a four vector. Second claim was, this is a four vector. I just have a question. Like, yes. Does it matter at all like, does it have any effect on the end result if you do, do a contraction of a covariant and a contra contravariant? Like, it doesn't affect anything. You don't have to take it into account. Um, the, the rule is that you can only take a contraction of a covariant with a contravariant uh, factor. So if you're going to take a contraction of two four vectors, one of them has to have, has to, have uh, has to be covariant, the other one has to be contravariant. So you can't do two covariants. Uh, uh, you can or you can't? You cannot. You can, but then you have to squeeze in a Minkowski metric, as we did before. Okay. All right, cool, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was about asking why was the mic. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand, because before I, made, I, I defined the contraction as, at least with a, a Minkowski metric in front, yes? Yeah. Now, you can do away with the, with the Minkowski metric if you make sure that one of the two vectors is contra. If you have two cos, then a Minkowski has to be in front. And what I'm really saying here is, and if you don't follow this, don't worry too much about it, what I'm really saying is that a covariant four vector is really just the same as the Minkowski metric times a contravariant vector. So if this is contravariant, then Minkowski in front of it will make it a covariant. Well, anyway, if you're not seeing that, don't worry too much about it. There's no physics involved there. So far so good, because now I have to prove that this is a four vector. 
Now, the plan is as follows. I have a thing now that I know is a four vector, this thing. Suppose that I could relate this thing, J, to potentials. Right? Suppose that from, some, from somewhere I get an equation that equates potentials, vector and scalar potentials, to currents and densities. <laughs> be very suggestive here, okay? <laughs> Hmm. How could you ever do something like that? Like mm -hmm. this? We made a huge point in the second lecture to show that you can always, by choosing the right gauge, always write it like this without loss of generality. So we know that we can use this in any observer frame. Right? Okay. So, yes, here's the plan. I know now that these two things are together, grouped together, this one and this one, make a four vector. So maybe these things grouped together also give a four vector. It's not as simple as that, right? But it sort of looks like it because these two together, sure, the row should be up there, but these two together make a four vector. We've, we've seen that. So maybe then these two also make a four vector. Let's see if that's the case. Now, in order to do so, I'm going to take these two equations. I'm going to use them here. Again, the idea is show that this is a four vector as well. Now let me write down these two equations, but, man I love this, I'm going to write this, let me start with this one, I'm going to write this one as a contraction. Can you see the left hand side must be a contraction of something? I'm not changing any physics, not even mathematics, just notation. While you think about this, let me write down what it is. Can you see that what I've written down here is exactly the same as what I wrote down here? I see some people nodding, I see some people shaking their heads, and some people... Well, I cannot read, let's put it like that. <laughs> now, while you ponder this, um, it's conventional in uh, this notation to always have one of the indices up and one of them down. I have them all down now. So, just to adhere to the standard notation, let me just write them up there. Still the same thing. Okay. It's still the Minkowski metric. Well, let's just write it out. Let's see what happens. Again, uh, this is one big expression of 16 terms. Because for every mu, you have four values. And for every mu, you have four values. So it's four times four, 16. Everything is added together. So it's a long expression. You can do this easily for yourself. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> okay. I had, did anyone have difficulty me writing down Dao Mu? Uh, this is typically written like this. So you don't have to write the f f fractions quote unquote all the time. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is just, I'm used to my own notation here. Uh, what it just says here, let me just write it in that notation. What it just says here is this, d dx mu, d dx mu. Okay. Same thing, there you go. Let's just write it out. There's a summation over the mu's, and there's a summation over the mu's. Let me write down the summation over the mu's. Mu is zero. Zero. Mu. That means that this becomes a time derivative. Because mu is zero, it gives you a time derivative. DDT. Yeah, and then there's this other derivative with the new that I haven't specified yet. Plus, 
mu is 1. Nu. Now, if mu is 1, then d dx mu is dx, derivative with respect to x. And then there's a derivative with respect to nu. Nu is 2 gives you a y derivative. And the derivative with respect to nu they haven't specified yet. And finally, so there's that. I've written out the four terms of the mu summation. Now, just as before, I can also now write down the new summation, but then this one will split up in, in four terms. This one, that one, that one gives you 16 terms. It takes you five hours to write this down. You can be a little bit more smart, because do you remember what the Minkowski matrix looked like? In the zeroth row, which of the columns did not have a, have a zero in it? The zeroth. So all the other terms of the news here in that summation will give you zero times derivatives, gives you zero. Just forget about those. The only thing that survives this summation if, if, is when nu itself is also a zero. But that means this is a zero. Another dt. Two time derivatives. So, just by being smart and knowing my, my Mikoski matrix, the way that it looks, what numbers are in there, I can reduce this to this. Let's continue. I have a Mikoski matrix where I have to look at the first row. In what column is, it, is you find the number that is not zero? The first. So, nu is 1. nu 1, 1. dx, that means that this nu is also 1, gives you another, do, another dx. To the x's, second derivative with respect to x. Now you continue this game, you get 2, 2, y derivative, and finally 3, 3, um, second derivative with respect to y. Now put in the numbers. What is, what is Minkowski 0, 0? What's that value? It's minus 1. So what I get is minus two time derivatives. Uh, this one is plus, yes. This one is plus, that one is plus. And I think this one we call just Laplacian. Oh, fine. So what I find is two derivatives of respect to time plus a Laplacian of phi. And isn't that exactly what we have here? So that was my claim, right? My claim was this thing is just a four vector notation of that equation, which I've now proven. All this rewriting and not doing any new physics. It's just what I have in new notation. Now, now do you, that we have seen that this thing really is this thing, it's the same thing, just in new notation. Let's use what we know about contractions. Do you see a contraction somewhere? Possibly. The reason I like to rewrite everything in terms of, of, of contractions is because contractions give me this special property. Contraction to four vectors in the variant. Four vector, four vector, with Minkowski in front, contraction. So this whole thing is a variant. We'll give you the same value for everybody. Under the condition that these are four vectors, but this is something you can prove for yourself. <coughs> can you now see that this equation we got just from using our gauges and our vector calculus and our the gradients and such and such? 
I haven't worked my way towards making something invariant. And in fact, when we derived this, we were never talking about special relativity. What we find here is that the way the thing that we found, you can write like this, and we know that this is always invariant. That thing was invariant all along. It was already in agreement with special relativity. This is the claim that I was making all this time. Special relativity was all this time built in, even before people knew that special relativity existed. Here you can see that. In very much the same way, this equation, well, it's really just the same thing, isn't it? But now with all the scalar potentials, replaced by vector potentials. Now, remember, I was trying to show that this is a four vector. Can you see why that is now? I mean, I'm sure you feel sort of why it's true because there are contractions in there, there's four vector-ish thingies in there, but can we make the argument really clear now? How can I now immediately see that this, these two must be a four vector? Trickish question, yes? Need some help? Need some help? <coughs> Could you just put them into one vector? Like uh, we can do that, but then we have four numbers in the column that we have called in you as if it's a four vector. Why is it a four vector? We haven't shown the mathematical property yet. Because uh, it is. Uh, it, it shows those, um, can, we, can we make those uh, two derivatives as uh, one four factor? No, no we can't, no. You can prove that that is not the case because one will transform as a Lorentz transformation right. and then you have to Lorentz transform that thing, you get a double Lorentz transformation which does not transform as a single Lorentz transformation. For the people at home, um, you, you listen to this sentence carefully and parse it and you will see what I mean, okay? Two Lorentz transforms is not the same transformation as doing only one. Uh, let's go through this step by step. Okay. Suppose that I now go to some other guy's inertial frame. Okay. So by this arrow I mean I'm going to go to some other guy's inertial frame. Same physical situation. It's just instead of me looking at it, again I'm going to take you. <laughs> He's looking at it. But it's the same physics, the same electrodynamical setup. Then I would get these coordinates will be replaced by this other guy's coordinates, yes? X prime. So I'm replacing this one by the other guy's coordinates. And because I've moved to his coordinate system, x nu will also go to the other guy's coordinate system, right? This is what you do when you go to one guy's coordinate system to the other. You change axis by the other guy's axis. That's what I'm doing here. Going to some other guy's coordinate system means this x is replaced by x prime, this x is replaced by x prime. And this one then is replaced by phi prime, hopefully, yes? This one is replaced by rho prime. Agreed? Now, same thing with the A's. Uh, minus J prime. She's going to some other guy's coordinate system. Now, in order to prove that these are four vectors, or that these are four vectors, I have to prove that my relationship between phi and phi prime is exactly the way that the Lorentz transform which should say that it is. 
Question. Does this change on the Lorentz transforms? No, because that thing itself is, is invariant. So this has not changed. How has this changed over the Lorentz transform? If you know that J is a four vector. By a Lorentz transform. Now, if this has changed by a Lorentz transform, this has not changed. How much this has changed? By a Lorentz transform. Same here. So apparently, phi a mu follow a Lorentz transform. How do I know? Again, two pieces of argument, because we've already seen that this is a Lorentz transform, or go by a Lorentz transform. We have seen that this is a contraction, so it does not change at all. So this must go via Lorentz transform. Conclusion, JU with a phi upstairs and an A, AX, AY, AZ downstairs must be a four vector. Is it AMU? Uh, no, it's J, excuse me. The other way around. Like the is it phi? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just mixing up with this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So here we are. My claim was, I started by saying, well, I'm just going to postulate that this is the case. That this is a four vector. I showed that by uh, charge conservation. And via our equations here that I rewrote in uh, a contraction language, I could show that this also must be a four vector. So apparently all of electric dynamics already from the get-go was already written in four vector notation, we just never realized it. Can you repeat the logic for this last step? Sure. Um, I took these two equations that I know hold, yeah. okay? Then I went to some other guy's coordinate system. That means all my x's were replaced by x primed. So that's what I did here. And my phi's were replaced by phi primed, and my rho was replaced by rho primed. Now, if I want to know that this thing and that thing are connected to each other via Lorentz transform, I have to show that phi and phi primed go via Lorentz transform. How did I do that? Because I know that rho and rho primed are connected by Lorentz transform. Because I have already shown that that is a four vector. So this thing to that thing is via Lorentz. This thing, because it's a contraction, just a derivative without the, the, the phi. This thing does not change at all. Now if this side has changed via Lorentz, this part has not, then this one must have gone via Lorentz. And as a result, these two uh, excuse me, uh, this one and that one are related by Lorentz transform. That's how I did it. Yeah? Maybe time for five? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, it's never too late to have pi, yes? <laughs> no. Uh, it was, it was 301 when I checked, so I was, I was a little bit too late. Here's the crappy thing. I don't have any cash money. So I'm happy to go to the Talbot time. Um, oh, you know what? No, I can actually, if, if, if somebody is, uh, is willing to walk there, you can use my card. I'm not going to give you the pin, but you know how that works, right? You can just hold it on top of the, uh, of the scanner thingy. And I will be notified if, if, notified if the attempt is more than 25 euros. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, should we, should we have some pie? And then continue with the tutorial? Sure. 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 Oh, so yeah, main conclusion, all of this on the left-hand side of that board that we built up, not knowing what special relativity, was already automatically spe specially relativistic. It was all four vectors, all along. Beautiful. Yes? Is that like a new geometric interpretation? Yes. Like, because like, we talked about the you know, concept, uh, Roland contraction yes. and uh, dimension, but in terms of uh, like scala, scala, scala potential, like yes. potential. Yes, there is. But I will do a tutorial uh, uh, after the break when, when you have a piece of pie in your hand to search. Are we allowed to have pie here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Okay. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> sure. Well, you know, you know that's, that's considered with Jocko's PhD day today, okay? So we're celebrating <laughs> him getting his PhD title. So let's, let's say. Yeah, yeah, he's, 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 had his, he's, he's had a ceremony about an hour ago. Oh. So uh, he's a doctor now, so we should celebrate. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah geometric interpretation. What I will do uh, after break when we are eating our pie is uh, one calculation that I would like to do with you is show you that now we know how the A's transform under Lorentz. We know it's a lower factor, so it transforms on Lorentz. We've now proven that. We can calculate back what the, how the E and B fields look. And then what you will find, I'm already giving away the answer, that because of the Lorentz transformation property of the potentials, you can calculate what the E's and B's are for me as compared to him. And then you will find a story that I've told before just in words. That if you take his E field, it turns into a little bit of my B field. Because his E field transformed into the new system. Uh, I will explicitly show you, we'll give you a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of B field. Where do I get that from? From here. Uh, Very short version. No, you know what, after the break. <laughs> So that's a geometric interpretation. This thing, in a very difficult way, when translated back to E fields and B field, just tells you that his E field has become my B field. Yes. Okay, who's uh, who's the volunteer? Seriously, should I should I go get it? Then you can choose the pie. That is very much true, and I I, I can't be sure that nobody is taking more money out of my bank account than you should. I mean, yeah, the limit's also like 25 a day, right? So I'm not sure how much you spent already on, on the crowd today. Because if you already, already spent 25 days, you can. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, so and there's a separate question. Is there 25 euros on my bank account to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out. Okay, uh, I'll go get one. I'm not going to ask what flavor you want, because that's now not my prerogative. Okay. High flavor. High flavor. Okay, I'll be back.